Good afternoon. I'm Carlin Bowman, and I'd like to welcome all of you to today's event um, on Richard Alba's recent book, which is called The Great Demographic Illusion, Majority, Minority, and the Expanding American Mainstream. Professor Alba is Distinguished Professor of Sociology at the Graduate School at City University of New York, and he has spent a great part of a long career thinking about how America has and is changing in books such as Blurring the Color Line and Remaking the American Mainstream. He will introduce his book and discuss why the idea that the US is rapidly becoming a majority minor minority nation is flawed, relying as it does on narrow definitions that assume a rigidity of racial and ethnic boundaries that has not defined the American experience with immigration. He will speak for about 25 minutes. After Richard speaks, we will then turn to our very distinguished panel, each of whom will bring a different expertise to this argument. Their full bios are available on the event page. Let me say a word or two about them. I always turn to Devira Cohen at the Pew Research Center when I need to understand particular questions related to the census. The 2020 census will be the fourth decennial census she has covered, first as a journalist for the two decades for the Washington Post, and since 2007 as a research, researcher at the Pew Research Center. Dee manages Pew's work on the 2020 census. You can follow the work on, on Pew's Fact Tank blog or using the Twitter feed at All Things Census. Mark Hugo Lopez is Director of Race and Ethnicity Research at the Pew Research Center, and he, play, he leads planning for the center's research agenda on international demographic trends, international migration, U.S. immigration trends, and the U.S. Latino community. He is the author of many studies about the U.S. Hispanic electorate, Hispanic identity, and immigration. A Pew survey of first, second, and third generation Hispanics is especially relevant to today's discussion. Rui Teixeira is a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress. He is also co-director of a project called States of Change, Demographics and Democracy, which documents population change and then analyzes the challenges these rapid changes pose to our democracy. Like Kevin Phillips' 1969 book, The Emerging Republican Majority, Rui's 2002 book, The Emerging Democratic Majority, written with John Judas, prompted much discussion and debate about the political implications of demographic change. The argument is especially relevant to today's discussion. Thomas Chatterton Williams, our AI colleague, lives in France and he was unable to join us today because of complications from the pandemic. We're especially grateful to Musa Algarbi who agreed to join us at the last minute. And uh, he is now the Paul S. Lazarfeld Fellow in Sociology at Columbia and a fellow at Heterodox Academy. He describes himself as a former philosopher and recovering nihilist dedicated to exploring philo philosophical questions through empirical research. He explores how knowledge is produced, transmitted, and evolved, applying these lenses to the writing that he does widely on race, inequality, policy, and foreign policy. He writes wide, widely about all of these issues overall. Each of the panelists will speak for 10 minutes, and after their remarks, Richard will respond. We will also have time for audience Q&A. You can submit your questions to Samantha Goldstein at AEI.org or on Twitter with the hashtag Demographic Illusion. A recording of the event will be available later today on YouTube and on the event page. Richard, let's begin. Okay, super. Let me bring up my PowerPoint. And also while I'm doing that, I wanna thank AEI and Carlin for um, arranging uh, this talk. So, um, so the book that I'm gonna talk about briefly is more complex than I can really um, express in the 25 minutes available to me. And you know, there are, you'll, you'll hear that there are multiple interweaving themes um, that flash by briefly in my presentation. But I just wanna say that overall, a way of thinking about my talk is that I'm um, analyzing the impact of rising diversity on American society and finding it different from um, our common widespread, our widespread conception today. So, whoops, this is, oh heavens, I'm sorry. Ah, there we go. Um, I don't know why, but I always have a little trouble getting started, <laughs> getting it to move at the beginning. So as, as Carlin mentioned, um, our, our widespread conception of uh, 
the changes of today and their impact on the future um, is the idea of the majority minority America. When um, minorities will make up the majority of the population and whites will become a numerical uh, minority. And let's reflect a bit on the image this uh, narrative presents of our society. It sees it as, as fractured in two along a racial divide um, with one side gaining over time and the other side losing. Um, such an image, I, I th argue, is inherently divisive um, because it appears to threaten the side that is losing. And indeed, um, we now have a robust uh, body of social psychological research um, that shows that whites, when presented um, with the scenario of the majority minority society, um, show anxiety, um, express more conservative attitudes, and also express more uh, depreciation um, of minorities. And at the same time, uh, political scientists see its effects in the outcome of the 2016 election. That is, in their post-election analyses, they find that the racial resentment, their phrase, of non-college educated whites was a major factor um, leading uh, to the Trump victory. Um, this narrative, I think, is colliding with a relatively quiet trend, a trend that hasn't been um, gotten the same kind of attention um, that uh, the narrative uh, has gotten. And um, that is the rising frequency of, of families that span this major ethno-racial divide between whites and people of color. Um, the, we owe to Pew Research Center um, re relatively uh, regular estimates of intermarriage that give us one uh, indicator of this, this mixing in families. And the latest estimate that I found on the Pew website shows that one fifth of new marriages unite partners from different major ethno-racial categories. Those could be, you know, a marriage between an African-American uh, and, and an Asian-American. Um, but the great majority of these intermarriages, in fact, uh, involve a white partner. And so therefore cross this, this division that is highlighted in the majority minority narrative. Um, and indeed, this is a binary narrative which sees uh, everyone as fitting in the majority or the minority side. So it isn't clear that it has any room for a group that sits athwart um, this division. But in fact, as a result of family mixing, um, such a group is emerging. Um, it has been growing in size fairly rapidly since uh, 2000 and by all indications, it's going to continue to grow, at least for the near future. And this group is the group of young Americans who come from mixed ethno-racial family backgrounds. And one very good source of data about them uh, is birth certificate data. And so here that you see a graph of the, um, the, the mixed backgrounds present among 27, uh, 2017 infants. Um, in that year, um, mixed infants were 14% of all births. Um, three quarters of this group was made up of uh, children who have a white parent and a minority parent, non-white or Hispanic. That means that more than 10% of the births in that year um, belong to this category. And this category, I think, is really different from the way we often imagine it. We often see um, youth of black white background or Asian white background as somehow representative of this uh, group of mixed children. Um, they are about a quarter of all mixed infants, but the biggest group by far is one that has really escaped much notice. It is the children of a non-Hispanic white parent and a Hispanic parent. They are 50% of all of the mixed minority white infants, 40% um, of all uh, mixed infants. Another group uh, that um, has really escaped much notice um, 
is the children of one white parent and one mixed race parent. And it will become apparent later in the talk why this group is, is uh, rising. Um, most of the mixed race parents are partly white and partly non-white. So we're talking about a group um, that is really, uh, you know, that is very likely in most cases has three white grandparents and one non-white grandparent. Um, this mixing trend um, interacts with problems that exist in our census classifications. Now, census data have been extremely important to the majority minority narrative. I dare say it would never have gotten the attention uh, it has gotten without in some sense the imprimatur of the Census Bureau. So the Census Bureau, both in population estimates, that's estimates of the current population, for example, declaring um, as it did a few years ago that the majority of babies born in the United States today are um, members of minority groups or, or children of color, um, but also in population projections. So it's in the population projections um, that, uh, that uh, or from the population projections has arisen um, the widespread belief that by the middle of the century, whites will become a minority and uh, the collectivity of people of color will become um, the majority. The problem is this, that the Census Bureau, um, really for reasons that are not scientific, but that are really kind of political and, and, um, and, and civil rights in nature, classifies anyone who is reported as having mixed race as a minority person, even, that, even when one component of that mixture um, is white. And moreover, for people who are um, mixed Hispanic, non-Hispanic, um, because of the way the data are collected by the Census Bureau in two different questions, they actually cannot be recognized as mixed. So they are treated as Hispanic with their race being uh, secondary. So in effect, these decisions move most of the mixed Americans into the minority side, even though um, many, many of them um, have grown up in a family with a white parent. This decision is especially consequential because of the concentration of, of mixing in, among children. Children, of course, don't report uh, their own ethno-racial backgrounds, their parents do, and their parents tend, you know, to be, to try to recognize both sides of a children's background in their reports. So that means the great majority of mixed children is reported as mixed and hence classified as minority by the Census Bureau for these public presentations of data that appear to support the majority minority narrative. There's another aspect of the census data that ought to be recognized and which I'll come back to also later. And that is that in its projections, the Census Bureau assumes that the um, ethno-racial memberships of individuals are fixed, mostly fixed at birth. Um, and this assumption really no longer works for um, the mixed Americans in the 21st century. Okay, so obviously this raises the question, well, how should we think about mixed origins in this century? And the stance I'm gonna take is that they have a status in this century that they have not had um, in previous centuries. Um, certainly, um, historically, the one drop rule ruled when it uh, when it came to the classifications of mixed white and black Americans who were treated legally in some states even as members of the black um, group. Um, but it appears that the one drop rule is really, um, uh, its pressures are relenting in this century. Part of the reason may be that the Census Bureau in 2000 allowed people to report multiple races for the first time. And this has brought new attention to the phenomenon of mixing and given it a kind of uh, presence um, in the public eye that it lacked in, in, prior, in prior periods. Um, we know 
from um, very sophisticated analyses carried out by the Census Bureau, which match individuals across time in different census data sets, such as the 2000 and 2010 censuses, that people from mixed family backgrounds have unusually fluid identities compared to others. And by that, I mean that they are not consistent in the way they um, appear in census data. They can appear as mixed at one point in time and as members of single categories at another point in time. Often um, they choose white, in fact. Um, so this means that we need to think about race, a racial background in a different way than we have before. Um, anyone who's taken a college sociology course probably learned in the first week of Sociology 101, the distinction between ascriptive and achieved statuses and that race was an ascriptive uh, status, one that was a trait fixed over the life course and, um, and assigned at birth. And through much of our history, that, that, that characterization of race has worked fairly well, but it will not work as well in the 21st century because of the, the fluidity of um, uh, identity among people with mixed racial backgrounds. At this point, I think it's worth talking a tiny bit about our conceptualization of assimilation. Um, I think, and I wanna especially uh, differ here from what I think is the conventional understanding of assimilation. One, an understanding that arose um, in the middle of the 20th century and is best exemplified in academic terms in a famous book by the sociologist Milton Gordon called Assimilation in American Life. And he presented assimilation as a one-way process, the minority assimilates to the majority, and also as a change in group membership, the minority becomes uh, eventually part of the majority. And I think that both of those aspects of this concept of assimilation are not helpful in thinking about assimilation in the 21st century. So I wanna put forward the definition that Victor Nee and I developed in our book, Remaking the American Mainstream. And that is that assimilation means the decline of a distinction, that a distinction that exists between blacks and whites or Asians and whites becomes less relevant over time to many social situations. It doesn't necessarily disappear. People can still recognize that these category memberships, but they don't necessarily interact any longer um, on the basis of them. Um, and with that in mind, I think that rather than think of assimilation as, as one group joining another, um, it's better conceived as individuals entering the mainstream of society where by definition, the role of ethno-racial origins in determining their status and in shaping um, interactions is diminished. And I think that this conception actually applies well historically, that it is a more accurate way of thinking about the assimilation of European, the descendants of European immigrant groups in the past, and that it also um, fits the contemporary assimilation. And, and one can say that what assimilation has done historically and may be doing today is to expand the mainstream by bringing in new people and to make it more evidently, visibly uh, diverse. And it did that in the middle of the 20th century as it appears to be doing today. Okay, so, so how should we then relate mixed ethno-racial backgrounds to this concept of assimilation? So I argue that the mixed population, the population that has, is growing up with ties to both the, uh, through kinship, to both whites and to a minority or more than one minority, it gives us the clearest window that we can find in data basically to examine uh, ongoing assimilation processes. In calling attention to the mixed population, I'm not saying that assimilation is irrelevant 
to uh, non-whites who are not mixed. We have acquired a substantial body of data about mixed Americans, though it's also very incomplete in a number of ways. But it's enough to give us, I think, a kind of sketch of um, how the mixed, the mixed Americans reflect uh, assimilatory changes. Um, let me note some of the data that we can use. We have, for example, birth certificate data, which gives us information about parents. We have census data where we can look at the characteristics of families that are raising uh, mixed children and also at the characteristics, the characteristics of adults um, who used mixed backgrounds. We have very good surveys now and I especially want to call attention to the Pew surveys on multiracial Americans and on Hispanic identity as giving us important insights. And we also have some ethnographic or in-depth interview studies um, with people coming from mixed backgrounds. Now, one thing that we have to acknowledge right at the beginning is that in all of these data, it's very clear that the experience of individuals coming from black white families is very different from the others that people who are partly black and partly white still suffer from uh, a great deal of racism in their lives that makes their experience different from many other mixed individuals. Um, in thinking about uh, how mixing is connected with assimilation, I want to emphasize um, the kinds of social milieus in which mixed individuals are embedded, because I think it's these milieus which really show um, best their position and trajectory um, in American society. And I think that overall, the data about mixed minority Americans shows that they are becoming part of the mainstream society. Of course, those with black and white heritage some of whom are also becoming part of the mainstream, but they suffer from a series of, of impediments or barriers that are greater than those of the others. And let me just mention some specific findings here that I think support this view. So one is that um, mixed minority white youth start life in more favorable circumstances than minority youth do. And this is indicated, for example, by their parental education, which is on average considerably higher. They are also more likely than other minorities to grow up in neighborhoods that are mixed and where they can also mix with whites. On average, they achieve better educational outcomes than minorities do. As adults, they mix with whites, but not exclusively so as, for example, they live in neighborhoods where many whites are present. They have friendship circles, which include whites. Um, maybe most critically, in terms of a demonstration, they have high rates of marriage to whites, which I think we can take as reflective of a white presence in their social environments in general. And as noted, they have fluid identities um, that can change from one moment to another, um, include both, and they can, those identities can include both minority and white elements or they may gravitate to one or the other. When they gravitate to one or the other, generally it's toward whiteness. Okay, I don't really have time to go into this in any detail, but I want to link these changes that I see as reflected in the experiences of mixed Americans to some other dynamics that are changing our society. And these are demographic dynamics. And so we are going through a very important demographic transition because of the association of age with race. Um, so um, for we are we are trans one aspect of this transition is to a much more diverse working age population. And this is reflected at the moment in the synchronization of two really immense demographic changes. So on the one hand, we have ongoing the exit of the heavily white baby boom from the ages of economic and civic activity. So the baby boom was the group of Americans born between 1946 and 1964 at a time when America was really a black and white nation, much less diverse 
than it is today. And whites were a very large part of the baby boom. And today the baby boom of a very successful group of Americans on the whole um, is uh, the youngest members are in their late 50s. So they are no more than 20 years away really from a complete exit from um, the labor market. At the same time, we have maturing into the ages of entry into the labor market, much more diverse youth cohorts um, where the impact of immigration has been very great in the sense that many of these youths are either foreign born or the children um, of the foreign born. So as the baby boom exits, in effect, there are not enough qualified whites to take their place. So that opens up space for the minority of, uh, uh, for the mobility of others, um, including many people from minority backgrounds. Is that happening? Absolutely. And is, this can really be seen if we look at the book talks about this. If we look at the top tiers of the workforce and we um, analyze those tiers over time and in terms of age differences, it's very clear that among younger entrants to the labor market, um, that, the, that many more minorities and people of mixed uh, white and minority background are taking jobs in the top tiers of the workforce than was true before. Or another way of putting this is that white dominance of the top tiers is declining as a result of these demographic changes. I'll just mention in passing that the same kind of transition um, can be seen if we look at the um, groups of college educated Americans. So if we look at them over time, um, the presence of minorities and people from mixed backgrounds is growing and has reached very high levels among college educated um, Americans, guaranteeing, I think, that the changes in the labor force are, go are going to continue um, into the future. Okay, so a few final uh, observations. So. I cannot tell you that at some point in the future, um, the number of people on the census who say they are white will not in fact be a minority of the population. I, I don't know, nobody really does. What I will say is that based on the changes that we see taking place in the mixing in families, the majority minority society, should it occur, will not look like we currently imagine it. And that's because it will not be a society fractured in two. It will be a society where there's a very large group um, that is linked by virtue of birth to both sides um, of this uh, divide. I think a better way of understanding the changes that are taking place is that the mainstream part of the society is expanding, taking in individuals that would not have been present in it in the in the, in the 20th century, um, it's becoming uh, more diverse. And this also happened um, in the middle of the 20th century when ethnic Catholics and Jews um, joined um, uh, the mainstream. So I think, so we are of course, I, I mean, this is an, maybe an odd thing to say at our moment, which uh, the, the moment is really dominated by today is height, dominated by heightened and justified attention uh, to racism. But I think if we, if, we, if we do not bring assimilation into this picture, we will not understanding, we will not understand correctly the contemporary changes and their implications um, for the future. The enduring paradox of the US is the combination of racism for some and assimilation for others, a statement that seems to me very true today as it has been true um, in the past. Nonetheless, I think that the US really needs a new narrative about the future of diversity. The majority minority narrative, as I've tried to explain, is misleading. It's flawed on scientific grounds and it's deeply divisive, pushing many whites, especially working class whites, toward uh, white nationalism and contributing thereby to our political um, polarization. In recent research by Morris Levy and Del Myers, 
they have shown that in social, using, again, social psychological experimental research, that alternative narratives do not appear to be as divisive as the majority minority narrative is. And finally, I think that thinking of our future as demographically determined is profoundly wrong. Our demographic future is indeterminate, in fact. It will not be determined solely by fertility, mortality, and migration, because the key to our future lies in the ultimate social locations of upwardly mobile Americans with some uh, minority parentage. And that's going to be determined by actions of the state in terms of public policy, um, by, this, by, the, by the growth or stagnation of the economy, which will um, affect the degree to which mobility will occur, but also by the willingness of Americans of different ethno-racial ethno origins to interact across boundaries as they appear to be doing today. And I'll end on that note. And thank you very much. Richard, thank you for an excellent introduction to our topic today. And we'll now turn to Devira Cohen of the Pew Research Center to get her reactions and also to talk a little bit about her expertise. Devira. Thanks, Carlin, for that generous introduction, and I hope to live up to it. Um, uh, first, uh, to as you can see on my next slide, uh, I want to give a small disclaimer, which is that Pew Research Center is nonpartisan, non-advocacy, and we do research in a wide variety of realms, but we don't uh, try to come down on any side. Um, I like to say that we report on the public's attitudes and not our own. Uh, so Richard Alba's book has as a central theme, I think the way that race and ethnicity are counted, the results of that counting, of course, and then the way that race and ethnicity are perceived. And that's essentially what I'll be talking about today. Uh, the next slide uh, shows us a little about how the census asks about race. This is from uh, an interactive graphic on our website that shows the racial and ethnic categories for each census and let you compare what was asked and what was tabulated. Um, race has been on every census since the first one in 1790. And of course, the categories have changed to reflect beliefs and needs of every era. Um, this column on the left shows you in the first census what was included. And the one on the right shows you just a portion of the categories that we had on the 2020 census. Um, today's categories are the product essentially of the government and society's needs for increasingly disaggregated data about the increasingly diverse population of the United States. But they also grow out of a demand from individuals and groups to see themselves mirrored more fully as individuals in the census statistics. Uh, the Bureau made an important change in fact in how it asks about race and ethnicity in 1960 when it moved towards self-enumeration and allowed respondents to check their own racial or ethnic boxes. Before that, the census enumerators did that for them, abiding by rules that, uh, to give one example, generally counted people as black if they had even uh, some black heritage. That embodied social rules that reserved whiteness for people without any other known races in their backgrounds. Now, as Richard Alba's book points out, that those rules uh, may be changing. Uh, the next slide uh, shows part of this 2020 census online form, um, not reproduced excellently, but it's good enough to give you an idea. And pay a special attention to the instruction at the top, select one or more boxes. That's um, of course, embodies the way that the census has moved more and more towards self-identification. Um, and it also, uh, beginning in, in 2000, as Richard stated, uh, allowed people to include themselves in more than one racial category. That change was the result of pressure from a growing number of people in multiracial families who wanted the census to recognize their identity in more than one group. There was a lot of debate about how to do that. There was some talk of creating a standalone multiracial category that people, people could check. But in the end, the census went to choose one or more or select one or more. 
there had been some multiracial categories on the census in the past, uh, nearly all of them uh, for people who were both black and white, mulatto, for example. Um, but the racial category of multiracial is not offered now. Instead, we allow people to self-define by checking as many boxes as they wish. However, the racial categories offered on government forms don't always match people's self-conception. Uh, these categories, as many of you may know, are decided on by the Office of Management and Budget, which decides uh, what will go on all government uh, forms, surveys, and the census. The next question, or the next slide, excuse me, shows the question that's asked uh, about Hispanic origin, which uh, has been on the census since 1980. Uh, the census asks about race and, and Hispanic origin in two steps, first asking about um, are, are you Hispanic, and then followed by the question on race. You may have wondered why in the previous slide, the question about race stated, for this census, Hispanic origins are not races. And that's because Hispanics, and I use the census terminology here in, in using the word Hispanic, in particular, often do not see themselves in the categories that are presented according to census research and our own research. Thus, the third largest racial category in the census so far in recent years has uh, been some other race, which was intended as a small residual category for people who weren't uh, included as, as part of other ones. The overwhelming majority of people who check the some other race box are in fact Hispanic, although it also sometimes is a choice of, of other groups such who don't find themselves elsewhere, some people of Afro-Caribbean, Middle Eastern, or North African backgrounds. When the census experimented with combining the, the questions about Hispanic origin and race, most Hispanics who responded checked the Hispanic box and no race box. The Bureau had hoped to combine the two questions in 2020 based on the idea that it collects better data when people can see themselves on the questionnaire but the OMB did not approve that idea. It may well re resurface, however. Um, in the next slide, uh, I'd like to talk a little more about the multiracial population, which of course is a central topic of Richard Alba's very interesting book. Um, and I'd like to get to the question of how that group is defined. Um, our own work at Pew Research Center has concluded that the size of the population of multiracial people can vary tremendously depending on how you define this group. So in uh, 2015, we surveyed 21,000 adults about their racial background and ancestry. And our conclusion was that the share of Americans with what we called a multiracial background is larger than the share of people who describe themselves as multiracial. And by multiracial background, I mean, these are, are people who are respondents who told us in our survey that either they or their parents or grandparents had backgrounds in, in two or more races. Nearly 7% said that, that that was true of them. But um, that was more than triple the share of those who at the time were counted by the census in its American community survey as being multiracial. That is, people who checked more than one race box in their forms. And I guess I'd remind you that for Hispanics to be counted as multiracial in the census, they had to check two or more boxes in addition to checking Hispanic. When asked, however, whether they identify as multiracial, most of those with a multiracial background, that is, their grandparents, parents, or themselves, uh, have two or more races in their background. Most, most say they do not. Only four in 10 of this group who we would define as, mul as of multiracial background said, yes, I, I am a multiracial person. Mm -hmm. um, so there's even more complexity than that as, as my next slide shows. As we know from census research, um, there's ample evidence for the idea that racial boundaries both blur and change over time. So here we see from our survey that about three in 10 adults, 29% who say now that they're multiracial once thought of themselves as being only of one race. And the reverse is also true that uh, about three in 10 who previously thought of themselves as uh, being of, of a single race um, now are 
see that it's also multiracial. It works both in both directions, essentially. Um, as my next slide shows, um, we've just we discovered that context essentially matters as much as who your ancestors are. So we asked people why they do or do not identify as, as multiracial. And among those who do not, we found that the way they were raised, the way they appear to others, uh, the way that uh, whether they've met an ancestor, for example, or the race with which they identify have a lot to do with whether they identify themselves as multiracial. And of course, as we know from the census research that uh, Richard presented, that identity can change over time. Uh, on my last slide, I'd like to close um, with a question that, that remains open. Uh, essentially, we don't yet have the results of the 2020 census, um, which is possibly the most challenging one in our nation's history. Um, these statistics will essentially set a new baseline for what we know about how many Americans there are, which groups they identify with by race and Hispanic origin, and whether they're any more or less segregated than the, in the census of a decade previous. I'm crossing my fingers that the census uh, data quality metrics will show that this 2020 census reduced the long running differential undercount. That is the fact that although overall census quality has improved over time, there remains a troubling gap by race in how well the census counts by race. So there's a larger undercount among black, Hispanic and some other um, non-white populations. This is important because in order to arrive at accurate conclusions of where our society is headed, we certainly need accurate data to do so. So thank you for listening. Uh, my last slide includes a little contact information and um, I look forward to hearing your questions. Dee, thank you very much. That was a very helpful discussion of the complexities of this issue overall. And now we'll turn to Mark Lopez, Mark. Yes, thank you very much. Um, and let me uh, launch the uh, the appropriate screen here. Great. Well, uh, everybody, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to be here. It's a real pleasure, and I'm looking forward to uh, questions and conversation. Richard, I really enjoyed your uh, your presentation, and I've enjoyed your book. Thank you very much for uh, for all that you shared. So many interesting. Uh, uh, thoughts that come to mind. And I see a lot of what you talked about in some of the work I'm going to share about the nation's Hispanic population. Um, so uh, at the center, we've been uh, taking a look at the Hispanic population for some time and have been exploring, for example, the ways in which it sees its identity. But first, before I get there, um, as Dee mentioned, the Pew Research Center is nonpartisan, non advocacy, uh, just to uh, share that slide again. So, uh, but moving on. Uh, the nation's Hispanic population has been one of the nation's fastest growing. And in fact, uh, when you take a look at the population estimate for Hispanics, it numbers around 61 million people. Now that's 61 million people who have self-identified themselves as being of Hispanic or Latino or Spanish origin on census surveys like the American Community Survey or the Decennial Census. And when you look at it that way, you can also see just how fast and how important Hispanic population growth has been for the nation's demographic story. At least since 2010, for example, about half of all population growth in the country has come from uh, Latino population growth. Uh, almost 10 million more people um, were counted as Latino by 2019 or estimated to be uh, part of the population in 2019 compared with uh, 2010. Um, that is a faster growing population in raw numbers than other groups. It may not be the fastest growing overall as a growth rate, that is actually Asian Americans, but it is one of the fastest growing. But there's some important demographic trends that are starting to really reshape this population in a number of ways, including how people identify and whether they see themselves as part of the group. The first is a slowdown in immigration. Immigration to uh, the US from Latin America, particularly Mexico, has been on the decline for over a decade now. And that's had some implications for the population growth rate of the US Latino population. It's much slower today than it was say in the 1990s or early 2000s. And that's largely mm -hmm. because of a slowdown in immigration. The other important story here is something that uh, Richard talked about earlier, which is intermarriage rates. And here I'm showing you intermarriage rates for Latinos in 1980 compared with 2015. And I think it's important to note that it's about the same, about one quarter 
of Latino newlyweds, whether 1980 or 2015 for this data, uh, married somebody who is of a different race or ethnicity than they themselves. Now that's not the highest, it's been higher among Asian Americans and it has been among Latinos, but it's interesting to note that this has been both pretty consistent, but also that it's been uh, one of the higher intermarriage rates overall. And as Richard pointed out, about 42% of all intermarried couples in the United States today are a white with Hispanic um, uh, spouse, or a spouse is one who's white and one who's Hispanic. That's interesting because that is the single largest group of intermarried couples, a white spouse with a Hispanic spouse. Um, and so I, I think it's important to keep all this in mind when thinking about how Latinos identify or see their own identity. And so one of the things we did a few years ago is we wanted to not only look at the identity um, and the patterns of identity among those who are self-identified Hispanic or Latino, but we also wanted to look at people who will say that they have a Hispanic ancestry, say that they have some Hispanic ancestor in their background, uh, but don't self-identify as Hispanic or Latino in surveys like uh, from the Census Bureau or even when you just talk to somebody. I've always found this uh, traveling around the country as a very interesting uh, um, a, a conversation to have with somebody. Somebody who will tell you very proudly that their grandmother is Mexican. But then when you ask them, do you identify as Hispanic or Latino? They'll say, no, they don't. And there's a number of reasons for that. I'm gonna share some of those in just a little bit because it inspired uh, this survey uh, or two surveys, I should say. Uh, but it's also just really, really fascinating how Latino identity changes across immigrant generations. So first, when we're talking about adults in the United States, um, about 5 million U.S. adults will say that they are of a Hispanic ancestry, but, ref but do not self-identify as Hispanic or Latino. That's about 11% of all people with Hispanic ancestry of some kind, but that's about 5 million people uh, in total among U.S. adults as of 2015. Now, we did two surveys in this analysis, a survey of self-identified Hispanics, but also a survey of people who indicated that either their parents, their grandparents, or their great-grandparents were of Hispanic ancestry to be able to identify that population. And again, that amounts to about 5 million people who say they have the ancestry, but do not self-identify as Hispanic. A little side note, they're pretty well distributed around the country. They're not concentrated in any one state like Texas or California. It's actually a population that's pretty dispersed around the country. So when you take a look at these folks who say they have ancestry that's Hispanic, but don't self-identify, we also wanted to ask them whether they've ever considered themselves to be Hispanic or Latino at any time in their lives. 17% said yes, but 81% no, says, said no. And among those who said no, what are some of the reasons they give as to why they, why they say no to this? Well, the single biggest reason was that ancestry was too far back. 27% um, said that. 16% said that they had no contact with their Hispanic relatives, and 15% say they have no cultural link and don't speak Spanish. 12% indicated that um, they identify as something else, not because they do not look Hispanic, and 9% indicated that the reason why they don't do it is because they were born in the U.S. and identify as American. So I think these are very interesting responses, but most importantly, most of these what I call um, non-Hispanic Hispanic ancestry adults um, they, for the most part, have not really thought of themselves ever as Hispanic, even though they say that they have the ancestry. Now, when you take all that into account, you can take a look across immigrant generations uh, among people who have Hispanic ancestry, what share identify or say they are Hispanic or Latino. If you're an immigrant with this ancestry, virtually all people will say that, yeah, I'm Hispanic or Latino. 97% uh, say that. Uh, for those who are the U.S. born children of immigrant parents, the second generation, that shares 92%. Among the third generation, this is people who are U.S. born to U.S. born parents and say they have Hispanic ancestry, 77% self-identify as Hispanic or Latino. But by that fourth or higher generation, you see that the share that identify as Hispanic is only 50%, and another 50%, the other half, say that they are non-Hispanic. The pattern is pretty strong and pretty well correlated with immigrant generation, how far you are from your immigrant roots. Another way to look at this is, is to look at um, whether or not there is a parent or grandparent that's not Hispanic or Latino in somebody's ancestry. And here you can see that again, across the immigrant generations, the share who say they have a non-Hispanic parent or grandparent rises. And by the fourth generation, or by the, I'm sorry, among self-identified non-Hispanics, that share is 
So clearly there's a pattern here of both intermarriage having an influence and distance from immigrant roots that have some impact on the way in which folks might see their identity. Mm. Now, Richard talks some about um, uh, uh, assimilation and experiences around assimilation. We've asked about this some among both our survey of self-identified Hispanics and our survey of people who say they have Hispanic ancestry but don't identify as Hispanic or Latino. The first question here is one about whether or not people were taken by their parents to some sort of a Latino cultural celebration as a child. And you can see that across immigrant generations, the share that say this happened to them often declines. Mm. So immigrants are more likely to say that, yeah, you know, my parents took me to such a celebration, probably no surprise, probably even happened in the home country. Um, but among mm. the second generation and the third generation, the share falls to 49 and 35%. Among those who are self-identified non-Hispanics but have Hispanic mm. ancestry, 60% uh, say that they were never taken to a Latino cultural celebration uh, as a child, uh, emphasizing uh, their distance from their Hispanic roots, even though they say they have a Hispanic ancestor. And when you talk about connections with the home country or the country of origin, a very similar pattern here. Interestingly, among self-identified non-Hispanics, people who have Hispanic ancestry, uh, but say they're not Hispanic or Latino, one third say that they are very or somewhat connected to their country of origin or their family. Um, that's interesting. And it's also oftentimes that people say that they're connected because when you follow up on this, they say they've traveled there. So they visited the, the, the home country. But again, a similar pattern here across immigrant generations showing a declining connection to or a feeling or a sense of connection to the home country. There's many more findings in our report that explores much more, including speaking Spanish, for example. And here you also see a declining share of saying that they speak Spanish across the generations. And also, interestingly, the share who say that when somebody sees them on the street, what do they see them as? So getting a sense of what, my, what I might call their street race identity across the generations and into that self-identified non-Hispanic group, you find that a growing share will say people see them on the street as white. And so that is assess an assessment from the individual in our survey of how others see them or how they think others see them. So some striking findings that are always pretty consistent in the story across immigrant generations for the nation's Hispanic population. I think one of the interesting questions is where will Hispanic identity go in the future? I think it remains to be seen. It remains to be seen in a number of ways. Will people still self-identify as Latino if there's not a continued or not a new large influx of immigrants from Latin America? Maybe Central America, what's happening now with regards to immigration from Central America might change some of these trends at the moment, but it remains to be seen. And then the second part is what even what labels will people use to even describe themselves? Will they even use Hispanic in the future? Latinx is already emerging as an alternative term. I don't know if it'll supplant Hispanic and Latino, but what will people choose to describe themselves as in the future? That too is something that it's hard to know. If you want to find out more, you can always reach out to me here. Uh, and of course, you can find our work at peerresearch.org. And I want to say thank you for listening. And I look forward to our conversation. So thank you very much. Mark, thank you very much. Um, we certainly hope that Pew continues to do the work that you've done. And this is really extremely important work overall. I want to remind everybody, even though we've got questions coming in through the chat room, that you can send your questions to samantha.goldstein at AEI.org or using Twitter with the hashtag demographic illusion. And now we'll turn to Rui Teixeira to talk about some of the political implications. Rui. Uh, thanks, Carlin. Uh, happy to be here discussing Richard Alba's very interesting and useful book. Um, so let me retail an agreement, a disagreement, and a question that I think are raised by, uh, that I react to in terms of this, this book and presentation. First, the agreement. I think uh, clearly from the blizzard of data uh, presented here and in Richard's book, I think we can all agree that you can count race, ethnic change in a lot of different, that using only white alone non-Hispanic versus uh, so-called minorities, which is everybody else, is indeed only one way of looking at the way the race ethnic distribution of the United States is gonna change over time. And that these different ways can produce some different results in terms of thinking about the future. Um, looking at uh, Richard's table four six in his book, um, right now, according to the standard definition, we're a 65% white country, but if you include all the multiracial, uh, if you include all the mixed, uh, offspring that have some white in them, basically, 
you get down from 63 and then to 61 percent if you include the Hispanic white mixes. So that's different. And then if you project it out into the future, uh, we find that according to the standard definition, will be 54 percent, uh, uh, 54 percent non-white. Um, no, 44 percent white in uh, 2060, going up to 49 with the general mix without Hispanic, and then we'll be 54 percent white still in 2060 if we include uh, all the uh, mixed race, mixed marriage offspring, including the Hispanic white offspring. So, you know, that's a different way of looking at things. It looks a little different, and that can certainly change the way you think about things politically, socially, how they're going to evolve. Um, I guess my view on this is that these are accounting exercises. These are ways of taking the data and rearranging them and thinking about what is happening now and what is likely to happen in the future. My view, I guess, is there's no correct way to do this. There's no platonic ideal of whiteness or non-whiteness or Hispanicness out there that we're going to we we're going to or can capture uh, with survey data. Um, there are accounting exercises and different ways of accounting produce different results. Now, but I do think that Richard's way of doing this does underscore an important thing, the fluidity of Americanness, that race ethnic categories are not fixed and immutable truths, and that the way we're going to use these categories, think about these categories, and even the categories we use are likely to change significantly over time. And therefore, what we can say for sure is that the future is not necessarily really about whiteness versus non-whiteness, or even about redefining whiteness, but it's rather about how Americanness itself is going to change in the future based on these shifts and these changing mix of the population. And that's going to present challenges to both parties, which is something that the States of Change Project has always tried to emphasize. It's not a matter about putting the thumb on the scale for either party, though that might have the effect in the short term, but it's all about how parties are gonna to have to adjust to the changing nature of the American population. So my view on the you know, mildly pressing issue of how the census should categorize in future data products is uh, I'm basically for uh, pluralism. I think it would be good to cut the data in a lot of different ways. I, I think Richard's way is an interesting way of doing it. I think the standard traditional way uh, has something to recommend it. Um, but I, you know, I'm always for more data rather than less. So I think that it would be fruitful and useful uh, if the census included some different ways of looking at the changing race ethnic distribution, both now and in the future, so we can see what the implicate what the different implications of the different definitions are and how they might work out as we go forward. So that's a, a sort of, that's kind of generally agreeing, I think, with a lot of where Richard comes from, if not quite 100%. But I do have a disagreement here that I think is of significance, which is that I take his political motive, the political motivation for the book and his analysis seems to be what I, what I take to be the following, in radically simplified form. The growth of the sense that we're going to be a majority minority nation has led to the growth or the increasing influence of so-called racial resentment among the white population, particularly its non-college contingent. And that has resulted in the election of Donald Trump in 2016 and the uh, surge of right-wing populism that uh, is looked askance at by, by many people in the country today. Now, I have a lot of problems with this analysis. Um, though I don't take issue with, uh, you know, his sorting of the data, but rather I do think this political analysis is questionable. First of all, I think it's doubtful that the majority minority census definition, however publicized, can really be held responsible for the rise of racial resentment. I think that there's a lot of reasons why these attitudes might have arisen or intensified or become more salient. And the idea that the Census Bureau has this power to uh, define in the minds of the great masses of honest workers and peasants in America um, what to think about the changing nature of their country, I think is, is actually a bit fanciful. I think it's, uh, it's doubtful that that's the case. The second uh, point here is that it's doubtful that racial resentment 
as the political scientists have defined it, really means what they say it means and what people have taken it to mean. As the, um, the Riley Carney and Ryan Enos paper has clearly shown, and there's been a lot of work along these lines, so-called racial resentment, the hardest working index in political science research, is really about is a sense that there is not a just and fair world, that people are not working their way up in the proper way. If you replace blacks in the standard racial resentment index with Ukrainians, Nepalese, or even made up nationalities, you get very similar responses. So the idea this is really about racial resentment, the way I think people tend to think about it, uh, is probably not correct. It has to do with people's feelings like their way of life is slipping away from them. Things aren't right. Things aren't just. Things aren't fair. And they're pissed off about it. Um, the third point about the whole racial resentment uh, elected Donald Trump thing count for the shifting of the voter blocks that actually elected Donald Trump on the basis of the racial resentment lens. As this is clearly shown in a very important paper by Justin Grimmer and William Marble where they attempt to account for the shifts that literally took place in the voting in 2016 on the basis of the racial resentment variable. It just doesn't work. It doesn't account for the shifts that we actually saw in the real world. So my view about the rise of Donald Trump uh, and his brand of populism and its appeal to white non-college voters is it's really much more complicated, certainly than these voters uh, absorbing the idea we're gonna be a majority minority uh, nation, feeling resentful, status, you know, status anxiety, and therefore they wake up in the morning and they say, I can't believe it. We're gonna be a minority. I'm really annoyed. I'm gonna vote for Donald Trump. It's much more complicated. It's about their changing way of life. It's about the economic changes that have really changed the communities in which these people live, uh, their sense of what the future holds for themselves and their children, the way the country has changed in short, not just in a demographic way, but in a political economic sense that has changed the very structure of the lives that they lead in their, you know, to use a favorite phrase these days, their lived experience. So uh, I think that is, uh, you know, an important point of disagreement with Richard's thesis. I don't, I'm fine with him cutting the data in a different way. I just think the idea that this is going to, you know, this is the key to diffusing Trumpism or even explains Trumpism, I think is, again, rather, rather fanciful. Um, now, the third thing is a question that I have about what does it all mean? Um, now, I, I, I'm sympathetic to the idea that, as I said, the evolution of Americanness is, is a key uh, thing that we need to understand in the future. It would be good if we move toward assimilation, toward non-zero sum expansion of the mainstream, which actually, again, has a lot of connection to economics. I don't think Richard talks about, but I think a question here that we maybe need to grapple with and think about is just how plausible is that at this point, not so much because of I mean, partly, I guess, you know, whatever you want to call it, racial resentment or the reactions of people who are sympathetic to Trump, but also on the left, we now have the rise of racial identitarianism. We have the rise of a sort of race essentialism, which is even more invested in the idea of whiteness as a thing, non-whiteness as a thing, blackness as a thing is defining who you are and where you stand in life and where you should stand politically on the basis of a very, very basic essentialist view of race and skin color. Um, this is not only you know, something, it's something we all talk about. It's something that have taken over many institutions and uh, mainstream media. I mean, this is everywhere. You cannot open, you know, the, uh, you know, a lot of liberal uh, outlets, for example, or, or media outlets without seeing references to white supremacy, whiteness, white privilege, and so on, um, regardless of what the substantive justification is for that kind of analysis, uh, it certainly tends to cut against this idea we can leave these uh, definitions of whiteness behind and move forward toward a more a sort of benign expansion of the, of the American mainstream, which, which I personally would favor. I just think that, uh, you know, oddly enough, uh, I think that the way the discourse has evolved is tending to, to militate against that at this point and provide perhaps a fairly serious obstacle in that regard. Um, so, okay, that's what I got, an agreement, a disagreement, and a question, and I look forward to the discussion.
Thanks very much, Rui, for those provocative remarks. I'm sure that Richard's going to have some things to respond to from you and the other panelists, but we're going to turn to Musa now to wrap it up, and then we'll turn to questions. And then we'll turn to Richard for, for his reactions to what's been said, and then to questions. Um, Musa, please begin. All right. So, all right. Um, yes. So, uh, Dr. Alba's look, again, is not focused primarily on politics, but um, on the broader culture. Um, nonetheless, as uh, Roy just pointed out, um, narratives about the implications of the US becoming a majority minority country have been especially pronounced in the political sphere. Uh, this is a topic I've written uh, and thought a lot about. So it'll also be the entry point that I use to engage um, some of Dr. Alba's arguments today. Uh, so in a viral article for the conversation in 2017, I argued that despite common narratives of Trump winning because of white supremacy or racism, in fact, white turnout was more or less stagnant as compared to 2012, and Trump got a lower share of the white vote than Mitt Romney did. Um, for reasons we'll discuss later, uh, Trump's racialized rhetoric um, and policies, I've argued, um, seem to have been on balance actually a drag on his support with many whites rather than serving as a key to his electoral success and may have even led to his political demise in 2020. Um, in 2016, Trump was able to win despite his middling turnout and slightly lower vote share among white voters in part because, in large, actually primarily because he outperformed Romney in states, I argued. Um, in a recent, um, what's more, uh, I argue 2016 wasn't an aberration, but was largely continuous with trends of the preceding decade. So Democrats have been seeing continued attrition with many groups since 2008, and Republicans have been seeing continued consistent gains with these same groups. In a recent essay for The Nation, and in other essays uh, over the last four years, I showed that these trends continued through the 2018 midterms and the 2020 general election. Republicans continued to build strength with many minority groups. In 2020, minority turnout was higher um, uh, than in 2016, yet the GOP increased their vote share with uh, most minority voting blocks. That is, they got a bigger slice of a bigger pie. They saw um, gains with Hispanic and Latino men and Hispanic and Latino women of various ancestries. They saw gains with African-American men and women, younger and older black voters. They saw gains with Asian voters from most ethnicities. They saw gains across religious groups um, with some of the largest gains coming from Muslims. Uh, these patterns hold in exit polling and pre-election polling and major national surveys and also by comparing demographic and political trends within voting districts, et cetera. Um, critically, most of this shifting seems to be driven um, by alienation from the Democratic Party rather than some unique affinity with Trump. Again, as I showed, the trends largely precede Trump, and um, if they continue after him, it could be a big problem uh, for the Democrats. Already in 2020, the Democratic vote share for many groups was approaching or has actually fallen below um, the pre-Obama levels. Uh, now, Democrats were able to see consistent gains in 2018 and to win the White House in 2020, despite their growing weakness with voters of color, because they had consistent gains with white voters, especially white men. Although GOP attrition with whites was broad-based, as I've shown um, elsewhere, uh, highly educated suburban, middle-class, self-identified moderates and independents and uh, young white people were especially likely to defect, which makes sense um, to, in a sense because these are the groups that are most concerned with things like decorum and civility and presidents being presidential and political correctness, et cetera. This is the sense in which some of Trump's racialized rhetoric and policies may have been a drag mm -hmm. on his um, performance with whites. Uh, so Trump um, has been consistently weak with these voters, which was clear in the 2016 primaries. And when one looks at the um, longitudinal trends, um, the voting patterns for these groups shifting from the Democrats to the, uh, I mean, from the Republican to the Democrat over the last uh, four years clearly seemed to have been a reaction to Trump. Um, there was a sharp shift once Trump entered the political scene uh, with Democrats pulling record margins with people who self identify as independents and moderates in 2020. Uh, the problem for Democrats going forward, though, is that because these voters are reacting to Trump, if a share of these whites began migrating back towards the GOP after 2020, 
then Democrats could be in a tight spot given their decades uh, long attrition with voters of color. Indeed, in 2008, many of these same whites swung towards the Democrats to usher Barack Obama into power and then started defecting in large numbers once he was in office, leading to brutal losses for the party in the midterms and a much closer race in 2012 than he saw in 2008. This is certainly a pattern that could repeat itself in 2022 and beyond. Indeed, despite Trump losing the most recent election, Democrats actually saw losses um, in state legislatures in the US House of Representatives and barely managed to eke out a tie in the Senate, showing again, the reaction from these white voters was primarily against Trump. They were not necessarily alienated from the GOP, nor were they embracing the Democratic Party and its platform. In short, Contrary to narratives about Democrats being on the cusp of a durable electoral majority, their position actually seems to be somewhat fragile. As I noted in a 2017 essay um, that I mentioned at the top, the GOP is nowhere close to getting a majority of African Americans or Hispanics or Asians, but they don't need a majority in any of these groups or anything close to it to deny Democrats a victory. If they continue to uh, hold or marginally improve their current levels with minorities while recovering some of the white voters that were alienated by Trump, then Democrats would have a very tough time at the ballot box. In the 2017 article, I sketched out a few more reasons why the emerging Democratic majority thesis might not work out as some envision. I noted that the way minority voters are distributed nationwide may undermine the ability of Democrats to translate the growth of minority populations into growing electoral strength. For instance, many minority voters are clustered in places that already skew decisively blue. This is a problem is exacerbated by partisan gerrymandering. And again, the GOP actually increased their control over state governments this election in a year when maps are um, set to be revisited and drawn. Turnout is another factor that may prevent Democrats from seeing gains that keep pace with demographic change because many minority populations vote less consistently than whites and tend to be inspired, uh, less inspired by appeals to negative partisanship than whites. Um, yet both parties have been relying heavily on negative partisanship in recent cycles. And of course, party platforms adapt. So in a world where Democrats did start beating Republicans, the GOP would evolve. Since the Civil War era, when Lincoln and his party managed to win all presidential elections for roughly a quarter century, there's only been one instance where a party has held the for 20 years, um, FDR and Truman. And since FDR, there's only been one single instance where a party has held the White House for more than eight years, and that was uh, Ronald Reagan and H.W. Bush. Um, enduring majorities don't, seem, don't tend to hold in the US because as demographics change and as public opinion changes, parties change too in order to um, remain competitive, as was well illustrated in Stimson's Tides of Consent. So I argued that models projecting, I also argued that models projecting democratic majorities um, seem to assume that the party will be able to maintain or expand its current vote share with minority voters indefinitely. Yet, as populations grow larger, they also tend to grow more heterogeneous, including with respect to ideological and political leanings. Hence, it should be expected that the GOP makes some gains in vote share with many minorities as groups continue to grow. Finally, I added the increase of interracial unions um, is also an important factor because many people who are of mixed ancestry, whether they identify as people of color or white, may nonetheless tend to live in com communities that include many whites, attend schools and churches that include many whites, have social networks that include many whites, and often end up working in institutions that include many whites, et cetera. From what we know about the effects of communities and social networks on voting preferences, voting patterns, et cetera, um, many interracial voters would likely trend much closer to their white peers than to the typical black, um, Hispanic or Asian voter. And making this latter point, I link to an ex excellent article by Dr. Alba in the American Prospect from uh, January 2016 titled The Likely Persistence of a White Majority. Now in his new book, Dr. Alba has expanded upon these arguments in important ways. For instance, he shows that mixed uh, race unions are disproportionately white and minority rather than being between people of um, two minority groups. Although the 2019 US Census estimates non-Hispanic whites as 60, 0.1% of the U.S. population. As he noted, uh, roughly 75% of interracial childbirths involve a white partner. He shows that interracial children are themselves significantly more likely to partner with whites um, or with other partially uh, uh, white mixed people rather than with non-whites. And as a consequence, second-generation interracial children tend to present and identify even closer with whites than their parents did. 
Now, a reductionist way of talking about this, popular in some circles of left academic discourse, would be to assert that these interracial people and their children are embracing whiteness at the expense of solidarity with people of color. And indeed, um, this isn't even a talking point restricted to interracial people. For instance, many have appealed to the concept of quote, multiracial whiteness to explain why um, say uh, black, Hispanic, or uh, Asian voters would have voted for Trump rather than Joe Biden or Kamala Harris. Uh, Dr. Alba proposes that this kind of framing is probably unhelpful. Rather than talking about minorities embracing whiteness, a more accurate understanding may be that the mainstream is expanding largely as a result of um, interracial unions. Indeed, part of the reason interracial people come to associate more closely with whites is because the mainstream culture is actually more accepting and inclusive of them than minority communities tend to be. For instance, he points out that among those of Asian and white heritage, 62% um, feel uh, accepted by whites, but only 47% say they feel very accepted by Asians. Among those of Hispanic white uh, mixed heritage, 72% of respondents said they felt ex very accepted by whites, but only 49% said they felt very his um, accepted by Hispanics. Therefore, both affinity with whites and an imposed distance by people of color tend to lead many people of mixed heritage and many people from um, immigrant backgrounds as well, especially second and third generation immigrant backgrounds to identify with and to strive to assimilate with and to thereby reproduce and expand the US mainstream culture. Now, one implication of Dr. Al uh, Dr. Alba's argument seems to be that the mainstream stream is likely to be more robust than many anticipated rather than bifurcated between whites. Themselves, but also a growing share of people who would be identified as minorities, including and perhaps especially mixed race people. For the foreseeable future, um, then, uh, political parties may be better served by appealing to the mainstream, by focusing on shared values, superordinate goals, points of commonality, bread and butter issues, instead of focusing on um, more divisive sort of culture war issues. With respect to Democrats, for instance, research shows that um, the sort of uh, white liberals who dominate academia and journalism and are far out of step with a typical Hispanic or black voter, let alone people with mixed race heritage or um, mainstream whites. And their efforts to be on the right side of history with respect to demographic trends, they often sabotage themselves then, alienating the very people they're trying to court, helping to ensure that their prophesized um, electoral dominance never actually arrives. Indeed, Democrats have been projecting themselves to be on the cusp of an enduring majority since 1964. And almost every time this narrative becomes popular, Democrats Democrats experience crushing electoral defeats. This is likely not coincidence. Instead, it is plausible that a belief that demographics equals destiny has consistently led the party astray. On the right, meanwhile, there is a perception that demographic trends are against them and that leading many in the GOP to try to find ways to suppress and exclude the minority vote. Others on the right um, they were, uh, view changing oh. demographics you see, you're fading out a little, and I think you're going to have to wrap it up fairly quickly so that we can let Richard respond to the other panelists, and then we'll turn to questions. Is that all right? If you can just finish your last point. Thank you. Yeah. But you're fading out. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm on my last point, basically. Uh, good. good. Okay. Uh, yeah, so on the right, um, good. Uh, so on the right, um, the belief... Uh, the view that changing demographics um, pose an ex existential threat to people's values and culture um, leads some, uh, as, as Richard alluded to, to um, uh, supporting ethno-nationalist movements to push back against white replacement or to defend white uh, Western civilization. But in truth, while uh, the mainstream culture will of course continue to evolve, there will likely be uh, much more continuity than change despite shifting demographics. Thank you. Um, so yeah, and I, I guess I'll just leave it there for you. Okay, good. That's perfect. Uh, now, Richard, we want to give you an opportunity to respond. Yeah. We have some good questions. I'll, we don't have a lot of time, but I'll uh, keep it very short. But okay. I, you know, so I'm very grateful to all of the respondents, and I'm not going to say a lot about the D and Marx presentations because I see them actually as very, uh, you know, sort of co they correlate very well 
with the argument of the book, um, they actually bring out each of them certain points that tend to be supportive of the book. Um, let me turn now to Roy and to Musa. And so one thing that should be said at the beginning is that this is not a book that is basically about politics, although it certainly is sensitive to the potential political implications of the changes that are taking place. Roy expressed um, a big disagreement, and I want to kind of um, parse that disagreement a bit. I actually, I agree with his understanding of the forces that drove the white working class um, into the arms of Trump. Uh, nevertheless, I think that he is underestimating the framing power of the majority minority narrative. And um, to illustrate that framing power, I just wanna point to one kind of recent event or one recent finding concerning the January 6th um, invasion of the Capitol and a uh, University of uh, Chicago history professor, or maybe a political science professor, analyzing um, the um, sort of the, the the opinions of um, the, many of the uh, of the arrested um, demonstrators, found that many of them appear to believe so-called replacement theory, which is an extreme version of the majority minority narrative. In fact, actually, you could even call it an esoteric version, but apparently it's not quite as esoteric as one might think. And it holds, it comes from Europe. Uh, it was actually invented by a man named Camus, but not, of course, our famous Albert Camus. Um, and it holds that um, elites are using immigration um, from, uh, from the global south to replace the native populations of, of Western uh, economically developed countries. Um, so I think that this kind of majority minority framing, or at least crude understandings of demography, how they're shifting um, to uh, against the interests of whites are, are, are important. Now, I certainly do not believe that simply replacing the majority minority narrative is going to solve all of these problems. That would be an absurd. I mean, you Roy, you called it a, a fanciful idea. I, I, I agree with that. But I do think it is a step um, in the right direction that we have to correct our understanding of what is going on in America and the, and its implica and the implications of those changes for the future um, if we're going to make progress and, to, and if we're going to reduce um, uh, polarization Musa, I actually, I agree quite a bit with a lot of what you said. I think um, that in fact, uh, you know, Democrats were quite surprised by the extent to which Latinos appear to have supported Trump in the 2020 election. And I think that one of the factors that uh, unfortunately is not really quite being grappled with by the journalism that has looked in to this support is the degree of assimilation that's occurring among the Hispanic population. Mark's presentation, the fading of Hispanic identity as well as of affinity with the Hispanic group over generations is a powerful demonstration that um, we simply cannot take Hispanic identity um, for granted. And I'll just say one last thing, and that is that uh, Ian Haney Lopez, who was actually one of the founders of critical race theory, published an article in the New York Times just before the election. He had done, he and colleagues had done focus groups with Latino voters. They were very surprised because they found that many Latinos simply did not identify as people of color. They wanted to be seen as Americans who were eligible for entry into the mainstream. And that's an example of the kind of change that I'm trying to underscore with my book and uh, point us in a different direction for understanding where we're going. Richard, thank you very much for that. Um, we have a number of interesting questions. I think the first one might be best directed to Mark or, or Devira, and that is, do we have any data on the voting patterns of mixed race individuals? You know, Washington is a very political town, so I'm not surprised that the very first question was of a political <laughs> Mark. Uh, it's, it's a great question. I know it does exist. I have to say that I haven't looked at it myself, but uh, we could get at it from the Census Bureau's uh, November supplement. Uh, 
uh, that looks at uh, how people voted in, in, in a previous election. I'm sorry, the share that voted in a previous election. Um, I'd have to take a look, though. I don't have the numbers off the top of my head. Ruby, would you, do you have it off the top of your head by any chance? Ruby? I mean, if you're talking about not sh vote share, but rather vote preference, um, my general impression of those data is it's pretty heavily Democratic, but, um, you know, I don't have an exact figure on my head. And I think that, you know, there hasn't been a lot of effort um, employed to try to make estimates of the actual vote preference of multiracial individuals, however defined. Well, you know, one, one fact that may be relevant here um, is that the Latino Decisions Survey, um, which occurred just before the election, shows in particular that college-educated Latinos and high-income Latinos were more likely than others to vote for Trump or to prefer Trump. It doesn't mean that a majority of them did, but mm -hmm. what I think it does signal is that the people who are most likely to be in, as Musa put it, in contexts, mm -hmm. contexts where they are interacting with whites. I mean, we know, for example, among Latinos that education is strongly associated with the tendency to uh, intermarry, that these are the people who are more likely they are, they're politically assimilating in some sense to their context and they were more likely to support Trump. Yeah, one question that I'm gonna to direct to Dee, um, and this is how can, sen mm. how can the census deal better with inconsistencies in the race reporting? Do you have any thoughts about that? Or is that such a complicated question that it would take hours to answer? Uh, well, first I wanna tack on one response to the previous one, which is, you know, we may not, not know yet how multiracial adults are going to be politically aligned because they're so young, um, mm -hmm. you know, many of them below voting age. So that's just something that, that may be a story that we don't know the end to yet. Um, on the census, you know, what the Census Bureau keeps saying is that its research tells us that if people see themselves in the, day, in, in the questions and in the way the questions are asked, they're more likely to give consistent responses. But um, so, so that may help um, smooth out some variation. But I also think from what we know of how people can change affiliation or identification over time, this may be an insoluble problem. We're going to need surveys, I think, like the survey that Pew did of multiracial Americans to really get a better handle on um, the numbers of, mi of multiracial and mixed Americans and um, the kinds of social contexts in which they find themselves. And I, you know, I think that a really, um, a, a large scale survey that inquired not just about how people identify themselves, which is effectively what the census does, but also kind of what their, how their parents identified themselves. What groups did their parents belong to would go a long way to helping us to kind of, uh, you know, decipher some of these important patterns. Richard, this is a question for you. And here I'm going to read it directly. You mentioned that many mixed race individuals when forced to select one race option often choose white over another racial identity. What role does composition of mixed race identity affect in terms of self enumeration? I.e. if someone who is half white, <laughs> half black, more likely to select black than someone who is half white, half Asian to select Asian. Do we know anything? Well, those are, those are true. I mean, that's the, both of those statements are true. We know that um, from the important Census Bureau research um, that links individuals across censuses. And um, let me mention the name Carolyn Liebler, a demographer at the University of Minnesota, who, who with Census Bureau colleagues did the kind of pioneering um, examination of, of uh, those data. I think what those data tell us is that in, in some, on some level, the fluidity of these identities is not soluble within the census framework. And that this is something that we're gonna to have to learn to live with, that in any census, we're going to see a selective representation of people of mixed background. And that representation may differ from one census to another. And again, that's why I think we really need very large scale surveys um, to help us illuminate a better the social positioning that lies behind the census data. We're gonna to have to wrap up in just a minute or two, but here's one more question for anyone on the panel. What role, if any, do community demographics play in the self-identification of mixed race individuals? 
that is, are those who are half Hispanic and half white, more or less likely to identify one way or another if they've grown up in a predominantly Hispanic area or a predominantly white area? I think it also depends uh, it, where they live now and kind of what their social uh, milieus are at the present. I think um, actually it was Dee who said context is important and I agree. Context is very important. Um, when, of course, as we've spoken, all of us have spoken about these identities are fluid and therefore they are in fact impacted by the people who that, whom one I, interacts with on an everyday basis. And we need better understanding of that, but I think we can go from that assumption. Well, Richard, it is 1.30 and I'm going to give you the last word and thank this truly exceptional panel for a discussion of a topic that I feel is very important going forward. We're very grateful for your participation and thank you to the audience for questions. I wish we could have, could have gotten a few more of these in, but thank you so much for joining us today and we look forward to another discussion of this in the future. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.